Hello fellow time travellers, welcome to the next episode of my love letter to the British Isles podcast series. Uh, on the early stages of our journey together, we fairly whizzed through time. Uh, we kicked off a million years ago, million year old footprints. We've had Neanderthals and hunter-gatherers, uh, we've had the biggest natural disaster in the Northern Hemisphere in the last 8,000 years, that was the Sturega Slide. Uh, we reached the point where our ancestors start to settle down, to live in permanent homes, taking ownership of fields, farming. They built the, uh, the monuments, uh, but it was anyway, farming was undoubtedly the greatest and most profound social upheaval that our species has known so far, going from hunting to farming. But before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about my Patreon site, uh, which helps us, Paul and I, to make this podcast series and to, and to make sure that the love letter is and always will be free. Uh, on the Patreon site, there are new videos every week, which are filmed here at my home in Stirling. Uh, they're an eclectic mix. History, comment, my musings on the modern world, and from time to time we do a competition. So, to offer up your support and to join us all here uh, on the site and at my home in Scotland, go to patreon.com and search for me by name, Neil Oliver. Right, time to get in the time machine once again and set off on the next stage of our journey. It's the love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. The people who made us, the ancestors, it's all there. We trick ourselves into thinking that the world is all modern, all ours, and we're just the latest tenants of rented accommodation. And the things left behind by the previous tenants, they're still there, underneath the floorboards, down in the basement. In my podcast this week, I'm taking you to a place that helps tell the story of the most profound, self-inflicted, social upheaval our species has ever known. When our view of the world and our place in it changed forever. Hidden for thousands of years beneath a thick layer of protective blankets in a landscape of breathtaking beauty. Evidence that marks the start of Homo sapiens' ascent to become the undisputed ruler of the world. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole planet. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In last week's podcast, you took us to Scotland and brought us face to face with the unimaginable power and destruction of an event from which the British Isles were born. Where's the next stop on your journey? We're travelling to the west coast of Ireland to the Cage of Fields in County Mayo. This incredible place shines a light on a defining moment in the story of our whole species. It's the time we moved from being hunter-gatherers to farmers. And that's when we had to start knuckling down to the daily grind. The daily grind is an expression that's so familiar for most of us that it's easy to forget that it, it comes from somewhere. It's just part of the language. Uh, but in truth, the daily grind is from the time of the first farmers. Uh, something like 10,000 years ago in the, the territory that we know as the Middle East, uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, that kind of part of the world, people began domesticating crops and animals for the first time. Before that, people had always lived by hunting and gathering wild foods. Almost immediately, once people had grown crops of wheat and barley, uh, it became necessary to use those seeds that you gathered every autumn. You use them to make food, and you do that by grinding uh, the wheat and the barley into flour. And from that, you can make porridge or bread or whatever, the, the staples of, of a farming lifestyle. And the fact of the matter was that for the first farmers, someone or a few people in every family every day had to spend hours grinding seeds into flour. That's the daily grind. It was a repetitive activity. It was going to have to be done today 
and you'd have to do it again tomorrow and every day thereafter. And when you became too old or too infirm, your children would have to take on the responsibility and so it would go on. We all think about the daily grind as having connotations of hopelessness, chores that never come to an end. The skeletons of the first farmers, when we excavate them, there are the telltale marks of wear and tear in their lower backs and in their shoulders, and it's because of the labour of being bent over the grinding stones every day. It's good to know where we get the expression daily grind from, because the fact of the matter is that the change that the human species made from hunting and gathering to farming is the greatest self-inflicted social upheaval our species has ever known. It changed everything. Our psychology, our diet, uh, our physiology, they were all affected by this profound change from hunting and gathering to growing our own food and keeping our own animals. That phrase, the daily grind, is still so common. It, it continues to sound modern and relevant, but it's ancient. Yeah, it's the literal truth though, it's grinding. People literally had to grind seeds into, into flour so that they could bake bread, make porridge. For the first time, people had control over whether or not they had food, rather than going out looking for it and maybe finding it or maybe not. For the first time, people could predict where their food would be. They could harvest it from the fields or they could slaughter the animals. But the, the flip side of that, the flip side of having a, a guaranteed food supply was that their diet became very repetitive. There would be meat, they would have continued to hunt. You know, the farmers, they would still have gone out occasionally or if they kept some sheep or if they kept some cattle, they would have very occasionally, they would have allowed themselves some, some meat, but their diet was very repetitive. And it's a, a fundamental change that it altered everyone's diet, it altered people's physiology. The hunters were bigger, healthier. In that part of the world, in the, in the Middle East uh, and in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Greece, the hunters were several inches taller than the farmers were a thousand years later. Uh, the change to farming, it gave people a guaranteed food supply, but it wasn't as good. You know, it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as varied. You know, a, a hunter in the good times had a better diet than the first farmers. The farmers just had a guaranteed food supply, but it was, it was limited and it was repetitive, uh, and, the, and, and the farming population became smaller and, and not as healthy, because farmers were also, uh, they were living in one place, uh, they were living in settled communities, and they were living in amongst their own waste, their own mess. They were living with animals, and so diseases that they had never uh, suffered from before entered the the human story for the first time, living with, with uh, captive birds, living with the sheep, living with everything else, people began to get diseased. And so the farming gave a lot, but it, it came at a price. And you can sum up the price quite neatly in the, in the notion of the daily grind. It's quite tempting sometimes to think of the, the life of the hunter-gatherer as a kind of lost idyll as kind of innocent children abroad in a garden of Eden, you know, just, you know, you know, bringing down the odd deer or, or, or gathering wild berries or wild fruit. And it all sounds quite perfect. But the reality would have been quite different. In good times, yes, the living would have been good. If the hunters were successful and they brought down an animal or an animal or two and brought it back, or if the fruits had ripened, uh, or if the, if the nuts were there to be collected, then people would have been able to enjoy healthy times. But there would also have been those months when the hunters were unsuccessful, when the prey was elusive. There would have been seasons when, because of drought or other climate circumstances, maybe the, the wild fruits didn't ripen or there weren't enough of them. Added to which, uh, hunters live a precarious life. You know, if you're out there with bow and arrow or spears uh, and you're confronting large animals that do not appreciate being hunted and when they're wounded, they can be very dangerous. So a lot of the hunters would have, would have had to put up with the possibility of injury or death 
as a result of, you know, being gored, being stamped upon, you know, pounding hooves and all the rest of it. So there would have been times when the when the hunting way of life was was very precarious, very dangerous. There would have been good seasons and there would have been poor seasons. Uh, so it, it wouldn't all have been a walk in the park. It still has a resonance today, though, doesn't it? I'm thinking about how popular things like the recent paleo diet was. Where do you stand? Would you have preferred to be a hunter-gatherer or farmer? I think if I'm asked to give a straight answer to the question, would I want to be a hunter, would I want to be a farmer, my heart tells me that I want to be a hunter. I think it's quite natural to be drawn to that way of life, you know, on the move, uh, moving from place to place, following the herds, uh, going in search of the wild foods. It does sound idyllic, it sounds ideal, it sounds carefree, but that's my heart making the decision. My head would make the decision that you'd be better off most of the time as a farmer. Another consideration is that for the people who lived by hunting, they had to limit their population, they had to limit their families. Uh, if you're a, a mum and dad and you have to move, the most you can do if you've got babies and toddlers is, is have two children because each adult can only pick up and carry one each and, and move and follow the tribe. And so for the hunter-gatherers, there must have been uh, infanticide or, or some other way of limiting the population. Alternatively, once you're settled in one place, once you have a permanent home, then children actually become an operational advantage because if you have more children, you've got more labourers. You can clear another field, you can plant more seeds, you can, you can bring in a bigger harvest. So actually, you know, bigger families actually become useful rather than the, the, the hindrance, the, the hopeless obstacle that they were to the hunter-gatherers. So there are many reasons to fantasise about a kind of a hippie, carefree, hunting-gathering lifestyle, but if you're going to be practical about it, being settled, uh, having a family in a permanent home, uh, being able to have a few children and having a guaranteed food supply based around farming and keeping some animals, it, it's obviously the decision that your sensible head would make. Where did farming begin? And what were their first crops and livestock? It's a very interesting question. As far as we know, uh, the first experiment with farming uh, came in the territory that's known almost romantically as uh, Mesopotamia, which translates as the, as the land between the rivers the rivers in question being the, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the Middle East. It's in the territory that we know now as Iran, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, that kind of part of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and, and people there began to domesticate animals. They probably started with sheep uh, because sheep in their wild form, uh, like, like goats really, uh, they don't pose too much of a threat for human beings that want to g grab them, get, get hold of the young, you know, take hold of them, have them in captivity and raise them, they're not too dangerous. Uh, when it comes to domesticating cattle, that, that's altogether more amazing, really, because they're all descended from the Oroch, the wild bull, uh, and the wild undomesticated bull was taller than a man at the shoulder and very aggressive, huge horns, pounding hooves. Uh, and the very idea of, of being given the job one day of going and or grabbing one or separating an adult from its, from its calf so that you could take it and, 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 and bring up a few of them as a, as a captive herd, it doesn't bear thinking about. But archaeologically, we know that, that people uh, in, in what is now modern-day Iran uh, had, had domesticated cattle by 10,000 years ago. So however it was done, they were up and running as cattle farmers by 10,000 years ago. And around the same time, some of them had domesticated wheat and barley from wild grasses. And the, the domestication of wild grasses is quite amazing uh, because th at the time there were, broadly speaking, two different species of wild grass. Th there was a wild grass that the seed head, uh, its seeds were quite loosely connected to the seed head. 
so that the wind or an animal or indeed a human brushing against it would cause the seeds to fall onto the ground, which in Darwinian evolutionary terms sounds like an advantage. You would think that that uh, that plant was scattering its seeds widely, and that it would, and that would, in evolutionary terms, it would come to you know dominate the world. But there was another species where the the seeds stayed stubbornly on the seed head, and you would think, well, they're not going to do as well because their seeds aren't going to be scattered so readily. But then you bring human beings into the mix, and where those those people are in the habit of gathering a wild crop, if you're moving through those grasses with your sickle with a sharp edge made of sharpened flint, you want to be able to cut through the stalk without the seeds falling off. You want the seeds to stay in place. And so the human beings would have prioritised the stubborn grasses rather than the easy grasses that let their seeds fall at the slightest touch. And so some some archaeologists have suggested that you might say that those grasses with the stubborn seeds domesticated the farmers rather than the other way around. There's a strange, mysterious, symbiotic relationship between the grasses with the stubbornly fixed seeds and the farmers who wanted to collect them easily. And those would have been the ones that they prioritised and those were the ones they planted. And so it was those plants that inherited the earth. And so, by 10,000 years ago, in the Middle East, you had people who were living in in, uh, semi-settled or or permanent settlements. They took the step of of clearing fields, planting them, and knowing exactly where those plants would be. And that's the advent of the first farmers. Farming is so ubiquitous and cemented in our psychology. We don't give it a second thought today. This was a giant leap, wasn't it? Yes, we're, we're coming to terms with it to this day. You know, people, the daily grind, you know, that, that idea that that gets a lot of people down, having to get up every day at the same time and, and embark on a job. Now, we're not all farmers, but farming structured the day for people in a way that uh, hitherto it had not been structured. Suddenly you had to get up at the same time every day, go to the place, do the set tasks, do them till the sun went down and then you went home, grabbed something to eat, went to your bed and you got up the next day and did it again. Now, a lot of people in the 21st century, they have all sorts of emotional troubles, depressions, uh, you know, struggles with that constantly repeating cycle. Well, we've been coming to terms with it for the last 10,000 years. Also, being in one place living in one house, having neighbours that you saw every day. That repetitive format of life is something that came to us with farming and we are adapting to it psychologically and physiologically to this day. Our species, Homo sapiens, have been around for about 200,000 years and farming only 10,000. So I guess in the grand scheme of things, we haven't been doing it for that long. No. And remember all the previous species. It's not just Homo sapiens. Everything before, the Neanderthals, uh, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo erectus, all the way back to the uh, Australopithecines in sub-Saharan Africa, the first of the apes to be up on two legs and, and beginning to behave in a human way. They were all hunters. So you could say that we've been hunters for four million years and farmers for about the last 10,000. So it's very, very recent. So we flourished and so have certain crops like wheat and barley. But in terms of sheer numbers, the rise of cattle is extraordinary. Yes, there's a, there's something there's something in excess of a billion head of cattle on the planet, uh, and we revere them like no other. There's no domesticated animal really that has meant as much to the human species as the as the bull and the cow. Uh, chattel, which is a, a slightly antiquated word now, but it, it's the perfect idea of personal property. Chattel, well, it has the same 
etymological root as cattle. So the first thing that people felt a sense of ownership about was cattle. And the Sanskrit word, Sanskrit's a very, very old language. All the European languages, everything, it all comes out of Sanskrit. You know, Sanskrit is a, is a root of language in our part of the world. The Sanskrit word for war translates literally as the hunger for cattle, which suggests that the first conflicts between different groups and different tribes was, was brought about by people trying to rustle the other tribe's cattle. That was the first war was about cattle. And we all know today, with global warming, you know, the methane that's rising from the vast herds of cattle on the grasslands that have been created by cutting down forests and creating these great grasslands for the cattle. So our obsession with, our dedication to cattle has changed the very face of the earth. How did this new idea, farming, make its way from the Middle East to the British Isles? Well, there's then a process that archaeologists and others have been debating for the longest time. Uh, clearly, farming had its advantages. Depending on your, your, uh, your psychology, depending on what you wanted from life, there were good reasons to set aside the hunting way of life and to become a farmer. But the, the process gradually moved, and it moved uh, in, in all directions. You know, obviously, eventually, from the Middle East, farming spread east and west. Uh, and it, it crept across Europe very slowly, like a damp patch across a wall. Uh, you know, it's, you know it's, it's, it's moving very, very slowly. Archaeologists have debated from time to time whether it was a a movement of people, whether farmers were on the move, migrating, bringing their herds, bringing their, their sacks of grain and always looking for new fields to plant and new grasslands for their cattle. Or was it just a movement of ideas? Was the technology, the science of farming just moving by word of mouth so that, you know, people talked about it? What's that you're doing there? Oh, you've got a field. What's in the field? Oh, a crop. And, and, and oh, I think I'll do that as well. That looks like a good way to live. So, Either you think people moved or you think the, it was simply the idea. And that's a, that's a debate that, you know, the different sides of that debate come in and out of fashion. Uh, but having started in the Middle East maybe 10,000 years ago, it was certainly all the way across in the British Isles by, let's say, five or 6,000 years BC. It's almost like an organism, it's almost like something with its own intelligence that's on the move. You know, it's, it's spreading like ivy, it's spreading across the continent of Europe. And eventually, it's even in the west of Ireland, which is the end of the line, you can go no further. For a technology that's come out of the Middle East, which if you're moving in a westward direction, you know, there's, there's no further you can go than the west of Ireland, because you've now got the obstacle of the Atlantic Ocean. It, it, it's such a, a determined technology, moving all the time. So it has taken a while to get here then? It took four or five thousand years. Just moving, just gra whether it came by word of mouth or by the migration of people, probably a combination of both. So it, it's in Ireland. There's a particular location which is known to archaeologists as the Cage of Fields. And it's a, it's a perfect case study really in the in the arrival of a certain kind of farming. The Cage of Fields uh, is in County Mayo. Mayo is, a, is a, an Irish word, it means the plain of the yew trees, so that, that, that what's now the county of Mayo must at some point have been known for its yew trees. Cage of Fields, which is the precise location in County Mayo, that's a word that means the fields on the flat topped hills. In the 1930s there was a farmer uh, called Patrick Caulfield and he was doing some work on his on the ground and it, it, a, a lot of his of the cage of fields it, it's blanketed with bog with peat uh, and he was he was cutting peat for fuel which is what people have done there since time immemorial you know they cut into the, the peat they dry it in stacks and then it's burnt and it's a, it's a lovely fuel it gives a lovely smell as it burns and it's got a lovely uh, you know a red rosy glow about it it's lovely so it's a traditional material that he was that he was collecting in that way, and he was digging down into the into the peat, and he, he found 
deep down, right underneath the peat, big stones. And he realised, in, in the way of people that work the land, that, that, that these weren't just random natural boulders. They weren't just naturally there. They had been placed there. He realised that he had some of the courses of a wall, big stones shaped roughly and piled on top of one another to create a wall. Now, for his own reasons, he decided not to investigate any further. He saw what he had found, but then he just went on, cut his peat, set it to dry and went home and told his son, his son is Seamus Caulfield. And Seamus became much more fascinated by these stones and in truth spent, has spent his entire life investigating the mystery of these stone walls of the Cage of Fields. Uh, and he has done it by prospecting with a, a long iron rod, twice the height of a man, and you take these rods and you push them down into the into the peat and you push them down and if you're lucky, you strike on stone and you can hear it like the ringing of a bell and you can feel it. You can feel that the tip of the iron hit the stone. And in this way, he has mapped mile upon mile of dry stone walls. In fact, during the course of his lifetime, he has found and mapped something like 70 miles of stone walls. And when you see what he has uh, been able to map, you can see that farmers working, as it turns out, five and a half thousand years ago, had built great stone enclosures on a vast scale. And they built them to help them look after herds of cattle. If you're looking after cattle on a large scale, then you need to be able to divide the herd up at different times of the year. Sometimes you need to keep the bulls separate from the cows. If you've got uh, cows with calves, you need to keep them separate and so on. You need you need different enclosures. And this is what Seamus has been able to map by using these uh, metal rods. Now, you might ask the question justifiably, why are they buried in peat? Why are they deep underground? Well, to answer that, you've got to understand a little bit about climate change. When farming first arrived in Ireland, you know, 5,000 years BC, uh, the climate was quite different. Uh, it would have been drier, warmer. Uh, there would have been uh, initially uh, open woodland that the farmers would have cleared in order to create fields and pasture land. They would have cut down the trees and then they would have planted cereal crops, wheat and barley and oats in those fields. And the conditions were good. Uh, and it was a, a kind of a Garden of Eden. You know, they were. it was a productive place. And then period of climate change set in there was increased rainfall. Uh, and when rainfall increases on the ground beyond a certain point, it can't evaporate. It, it, the, the ground becomes permanently sodden because the available sunlight isn't, isn't evaporating the, the wetness. So the ground gets waterlogged. There are plants that enjoy that kind of environment and they grow, but when they have had their lives and they die, they don't decompose. Uh, the anaerobic conditions of this waterlogged environment preserve them. There are tannins that gradually uh, that, that, that preserve the, all that material and it, it builds up thicker and thicker and thicker. Uh, it's like blankets piled up on a bed. Uh, and so it starts out just with one layer of vegetation, but then as the years go on, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. This process has been going on in places like Ireland for thousands of years. And by now, in a place like County Mayo, the blanket bog is, is as much as 15 feet thick, completely smothering the older landscape, like a thick duvet laid over the landscape. It's burying everything that went before. And so what Seamus Caulfield is doing is, is probing down through this thick layer of peat and finding these buried walls. But something on that scale speaks to a whole farming community many, many people all working together to build the walls and to look after their herd of cattle. It speaks of a great deal of social organisation and that's another amazing feature of the, of the move to farming. People had to work together. You know, hunters, you know, hunting, hunting bands, families, tribes, you know, they could, they could roam in the landscape, but if farmers wanted to get anything done, then they had to collaborate. It, it fosters a kind of collaborate, collegiate activity. And that's what you see at the Cage of Fields, these, these vast enclosures of dry stone walls that these people had worked to create so that they could look after and take care of their cattle. 
Uh, and the fact that, you know, after thousands of years, that technology, uh, that desire to live differently had come all the way to the west of Ireland, I find, uh, you know, profoundly moving. And it does something to people. The adoption of farming makes them think and behave differently. Hunters, the people who live by hunting and gathering, who, who roam across the landscape, in all likelihood they feel that they belong to the land, that, that, that they are part of the landscape and that they are brother to the bear, you know, sister to the deer, you know, that they have some kind of relationship with the animals. Farmers are different. Farmers seem to feel that they own the land and that with that ownership comes a sense of responsibility. You know, they have to take care of the land. They own it now. And with it seems to come almost an obligation to alter the landscape. So they build on it for the first time. The hunters don't build. Hunters don't build houses. They don't build dry stone walls. They don't build tombs for the dead. Those are all practices that come with farming. And so you have people who for the first time are fixed in the landscape. They live in one place for the whole of their lifetime. And then their children are born there and they live there for the whole of their lifetime. As people die, they raise tombs. And for the first time, people start to bury their dead in great stone houses of the dead. They build houses for themselves. You know, they live in permanent locations. They live in a permanent address. They have neighbours. You know, they have the same people that they see every day. The, the adoption of farming makes people live and behave and think in a profoundly different way. Cage of Fields, the oldest known field system in the world, is a snapshot of that transformation and how the whole planet was changed. Yes, farming, farming eventually reached everywhere. Of course, in certain places, in certain, in certain remote locations, there are still people who haven't adopted farming. There are still hunters in the, in the, in the rainforests of the Amazon. You know, there are still people who live in the old way, in the original way. But for the vast majority of the population, the, the consequences of farming were deep and permanent and long-lasting, and they changed everything. They changed the way that people live, and those changes are still with us today. What was Cager Fields like when the first farming began? The landscape was completely different. The, the blanket bog was yet to form. It was, gra it was grassland. It was the kind of terrain that was suitable for cattle. It was also the kind of terrain that was suitable for fields where you could grow cereal crops. It was profoundly different. And those people would have had generation after generation of living that way, building their walls, looking after their cattle, raising their crops. It's all there. Climate change has simply sealed it as though a uh, like a time capsule, y y the climate changed. The people would have would have been would have been driven off. They would have moved away and started farming and living elsewhere. And in that terrain, the the bog came to dominate, and it smothered the landscape. And it it it, it changed everything. And it has trapped beneath it that time of the first farmers trapped there like a like a, a flower between the pages of a book. What was it like when you had a go at defining for the Neolithic fields with these big iron rods? To go down into the into the peat like a knife through butter, it's not difficult. You know, you just you just push it down. It's, it's got just the texture of butter. And if you're if you're holding on to one of these rods when it goes down, and ten or fifteen feet under your feet, and the the, the bog it moves. It's like um, it's like it's, sometimes it's like standing on a rice pudding. You know, it, it's it's kind of uh, shugly and jiggly under your feet. It's a bit soft. And you, you push the, the rod down, and if you're lucky, you hit the stone. You hit one of these walls, and you can hear this ting, 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 ting of the tip of the rod hitting the stone. And you know that although you're separated by some feet of peat, you're making contact with a stone, a dressed stone that was set in place by an Irish farmer five and a half thousand years ago. And when you feel that contact and you hear that sound, 
all the years, those five and a half millennia, just fall away and you've made contact with the world of those Neolithic farmers. It's extraordinary to think it is just underneath our feet, isn't it? It's all underneath our feet. That's the amazing thing. The past hasn't gone away. The, the past, it, it's layers of an onion. The onion is growing all the time. The passing of people's lives creates another layer on the outside of the onion. And everything that went before just gets buried a little bit deeper. But in the particular case of, of the Cage of Fields in County Mayo, because the, the, the intervening layer is made of this soft peat, you can push an iron rod all the way through, through five and a half thousand years of past time and make contact. And that's just the Neolithic. Underneath the Neolithic is the time of the hunters who came before the, who came before the farmers. It's all still there. That is the miracle. You walk around these British Isles and know whether you're walking on a paved street in London or in Glasgow or in Belfast or in Dublin, underneath your feet, underneath your feet is the past. It's all still there. Yeah, the people who made us. The people who made us, the ancestors, it's all there. And we, we trick ourselves into thinking that, that the, the world is all modern, all ours, and we're just the latest tenants of rented accommodation. And the things left behind by the previous tenants, they're still there underneath the floorboards, down in the basement. And we are quite newcomers as well. Yes. We're, we're incredibly recent. You know, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. Our time will have come and gone and we will be replaced by others. There is nothing more certain than that. In 2003, a farmer in Orkney was working the land when his plough hit something large. This chance discovery on a normal, everyday sort of morning turned out to be a piece of dressed masonry that leads us back thousands of years to one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these isles of ours. Go to the website to see the places I've chosen and let me know the locations that inspire you. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Teddy, and Archie. Finance, Catherine and Trudy. Post-production, Althorpe Studios. Photography by Neil R. Graphics, Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. An FBF Podcasts production.